if we haven't met yet, I'm Mary Beth Grable, the Arlene and Harold Schnitzer Curator of Asian Art here at the Portland Art Museum. And it's been my extraordinary privilege and honor um, to be the um, he head curator for this exhibition and, and project, um, helped, of course, by many other people. Um, uh, so this evening, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the keynote lecture for our symposium in conjunction with the exhibition, Poetic Imagination in Japanese Art, Selections from the Collection of Mary and Cheney Coles. This symposium marks the 20th anniversary of the Mildred Snitzer Memorial Lecture in Asian Art series, which honors uh, Mildred Snitzer, the founder of the museum's Asian Art Council. Um, and I would like to thank Mildred's daughters, Dory, Susan, and Jean, who are here this evening, um, as well as the many members of the Asian Art Council who over the last two decades have provided ongoing support for that endowment. It's only one of two endowed lecture series here at the museum, and it has allowed us to bring in outstanding scholars um, again and again uh, to, for Portland and Oregon audiences. This year, we're also especially fortunate to have two additional sponsors who generously contributed. Uh, one of those is Bonhams, and this evening we have their vice president and director of Asian art, Dessa Goddard, and other members of their staff here, so thank you. Um, and also the Metropolitan Center for Far Eastern Art Studies gave us a grant to offer travel convention to graduate students to attend tonight. So we um, are deeply grateful to all of these sponsors and to all of you for coming from near and far. I know that we, uh, our audience is about half, members of the Asian Art Museum, or perhaps a little bit more, but they, we have quite a few people who've come from uh, Tokyo and, and New York uh, and other distant places to join us tonight. So thank you for being here to join us in celebrating the world premiere of the Coles Collection. We are profoundly grateful to the many people who made the exhibition itself possible, beginning with Mary and Cheney Coles, who for the past decade have welcomed me and other members of the curatorial team into their home repeatedly. The Coles have been generous supporters of the Portland Art Museum in many ways, um, including through gifts of art, and a small selection of their gifts is on view upstairs adjacent to the exhibition galleries. The scope of this exhibition, spanning 12 centuries of Japanese painting and calligraphy, is far beyond my expertise. We have been fortunate in assembling an international team of scholars who have worked together over the past two years to determine the selection of works and to research and write about them for the forthcoming publication. In addition to those who are gathered here this weekend, and you have a program with you, but I will mention their names, Sarako Oki, Arata Shimao, Paul Berry, and Michio Morioka, I want to thank Professor Masaaki Arakawa of Gakushuin University, who was our consultant for the ceramics. The gallery labels uh, are deeply indebted to their research and writings. Many others, including some who are with us tonight, but too numerous to list here, assisted with deciphering difficult uh, kanji and translating text, so thank you to those people as well. Our speaker this evening, Professor Joshua Mostow, contributed the introductory essay to the catalog, an overview of the history of Japanese poetry and its reflections in visual arts. I've known Joshua Mostow for, I think, close to 40 years, and he is in that entire period, he's one of the most indefatigable people I've known. Um, he jets around the world from his base in Vancouver, Canada, um, teaching and participating in conferences across Europe, North America, and Asia. He has a well-deserved reputation as one of the foremost interpreters of waka, or traditional Japanese poetry. I'm happy to say that we were able to obtain several copies of one of his seminal publications, Pictures of the Heart, the Hyakunin Issue in Word and Image, 
in our museum shop. Grab them while you can. Um, it's an honor to have Professor Mostow as a colleague and to have him join us in this project. Please join me in welcoming him to the podium. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you all for uh, coming here tonight. Um, it's been a great pleasure for me to work on one particular object in the collection, um, a kind of work that I have not had a lot of experience with. Um, and I hope I will make it interesting for you. Um, let's see how we get this to go. There we go, okay. So, Art historians and other scholars are often, in a sense, confronted with objects such as this one, beautiful, but lacking context. Rarely do such works come with a title or a description of their origin. If they do, those titles or descriptions may be later attributions. In the present case, what we first see is an album of 24 sheets of decorated paper called shikishi on which have been inscribed Japanese poems. Little cartouches like that uh, in the upper right hand corner give the names of people, presumably the calligraphers of the accompanying poems. Each sheet includes the name or title of the poet, here and here. Um, I hope that's right, I can't quite see that far side of it. Um, each sheet includes the name or title of the poet. Tonight, I would like to take each element of this work, tracing its history and context, peeling them back like layers of an onion. Hopefully, we will not be left with nothing at the end, and there will be no tears. <laughs> we start with the oldest element, which is the poems. They are waka, called in modern Japanese, tanka, or short poems, and indeed they are, only 31 syllables each. The oldest poem uh, contained in the album here, is um, by Yamabe no Akahito, who was a court poet in the early 8th century. As you probably know, waka are in five lines of 57577 five, seven syllables. Following this lineation, Akahito's poem reads, oops, that's wrong. There we go. Asakara wa waka na tsuman to shimeshi no ni, kino mo kyo mo. Yuki wa furitsutsu, which has been translated, roped off the fields that the courtiers can set out tomorrow to pick the new spring greens, but yesterday and now again today, they are covered by snow. The poem refers to the annual ritual of courtiers gathering spring greens, often just peeking out from the snow at the beginning of the new year to make a gruel believed to ensure long life. Such gruel is still eaten by many uh, in Japan today as part of New Year's festivities. However, in Akahito's day, poems were recorded in Chinese characters, or kanji, through a system known as manyogana, or the manyoshu syllabary, named after the first great anthology of Japanese poetry, the collection of 10,000 ages, or manyoshu. In this system, Chinese characters were sometimes used, so uh, what I want is, yes, here. Chinese characters were used for their meaning, um, but sometimes just for their sound. Um, and this is a section of the Katsurabon manuscript, the oldest extant, if fragmentary, manuscript of the Manyoshu, dating from the mid 11th century. Let's take one poem. Uh, this is a poem sent by Princess Unakami to Emperor Shomu. And you have here, this is the title. Here's the poem in Chinese characters, which I've represented here. And here it is in kana, the Japanese syllabary. Um, and I imagine we have a translation coming up. Yeah, sure we do. Uh, though far away, like the night sound of the nail-plucked catalpa bows, hearing word of my Lord's coming makes me happy. 
So the emperor is coming to visit her for a romantic assignation. Now, this man, in this manuscript, uh, as we saw, um, the Chinese characters are on the right, um, and, uh, they're the, and the kana on the left. The Chinese characters are mostly used for their meaning. One can just go straight down and say, katao, bo, bo, uh, nail, pole, night, sound. Um, but um, this character here is being used to represent the sound no, but it's used here to represent the sound shi. Uh, it's not consistent. Now, obviously, this was not a very good way to record poetry. And the way to kind of translate these uh, versions uh, was forgotten fairly quickly. This was an early attempt at reconstructing it. Um, fortunately, the Japanese designed a writing system much more uh, suitable to their highly agglutinative language, using cursive forms of Chinese characters solely for their sound value, what is called kana. Now, many of you may have learned modern hiragana and katakana, but it was a little more complicated uh, in the past, where any sound, ah, for instance, or e, uh, could be represented by several different cursive kanji. And I took a quick look at one of my dictionaries, and I found one sound that is represented consistently by 13 different kanji. So you have to know all those if you're going to make any sense out of it. Uh, and this is why, um, even if you've studied kana, this is going to be tough for you. Uh, asu, that's a ka, kara wa wa kana, tsumu, to, that's a shi. Um, so it's a different alphabet, essentially, that only misguided people learn, uh, like scholars. Uh, now, you might wonder why, when I'm explaining Manyogana to you, I didn't use a manuscript version of Akahito's poem. And the reason is because, um, in fact, uh, that poem uh, that we saw about the fields um, is not by Akahito. It was attributed to him much later. Uh, in a 13th century anthology. And this is one of the lessons we're going to learn tonight, is that things often don't look like what they are, okay? So, I'll come back to the rest of the writing on the page in a moment, but first I'd like to discuss the page itself, that is, the decorated paper. As I mentioned earlier, this is called a shikishi, literally color paper. The Japanese excelled at paper making from early on, and we have examples from the Heian period of poetry collections on decorated paper, such as this piece, uh, the Oegiri section of the Koking Wakashu, attributed to Fujiwara no Sadayori, but probably dating from the early 12th century. Um, in, this shiki sh uh, in this period, shikishi were most commonly used to have poems written on them, and then affixed to large decorative folding screens, or byobu. And we see a couple examples of that uh, here. So here are the squares of poetry. Oh, it's really hard for me to see from here. And even more, all here would have had poems written on them. Now, in fact, the calligraphy was much more highly prized than the paintings on the screens. And if the screens were damaged, which was easy to do because they're big, five feet high, um, people would try to salvage the calligraphy papers. Somewhere in the 16th century, or some time in the 16th century, the album format, gajo, was introduced from Song, China to Japan and provided the perfect medium to preserve shikishi and even the papers from decorated folding fans, like this. Um, soon, new works were uh, designed of shikishi or fan papers to be directly mounted into albums. In the early 17th century, the most famous artist of shikishi was Tawaraya Sotatsu, and an example of his work uh, is in the show with calligraphy by Shokado Shoujo, one of the three most esteemed calligraphers of his day. Here, Sotatsu has depicted kikyo, or Chinese bell flowers. Um, now, 
in gold and silver, the silver has oxidized to black. So if you can imagine what it would have looked like if it was silver and gold, you'll get a better idea of what was intended. Now, often there is no relationship between the visual motifs on the paper and the poems written on it. Uh, the poem here is traditionally attributed to Kakinomoto no Hitomaro, a contemporary of Akahito, and it reads, Honobono to akashi no ura no asagiri ni shimagakure yuku fune wo shizoumo. Faintly, faintly through the morning mist in the bay of Akashi, my thoughts follow the boat that becomes island hidden. Now, this has nothing to do with bellflowers, uh, which is what the visual motif is. The only possible connection is that both bellflowers and mist, or kiri, are autumnal topics. But there is no guarantee that Sotatsu designed this particular shikishi for this particular poem. And yes, the poem's not really by Hitomato. Um, uh, but it became his kind of signature verse. And so that's why in the triptych that is also in the show, up at the very top, you see sails going behind them, the island, becoming island hidden. So I suppose properly, even though I and almost everyone I know translates this poem with just one boat, um, maybe we should talk about the boats that become island hidden. So the shikishi uh, in, employ what is called ryoshi soushoku, or paper decoration. Uh, let's look again at the first sheet. Starting in the upper right-hand corner, uh, there are large irregular pieces of gold and silver foil. Coming down, we have a kind of water scene with lotus leaves and reeds. So there you see lotus leaves and then some reeds um, done in black ink and then a cloud-like shape made of uh, ground gold and then a shoreline uh, done in ground gold and silver used like paint with small scattered squares of gold and silver foil. Oops, not like that. Yeah, okay, good, here. Mm. Following the shore to the left, we get a shape that would seem to represent a full moon here. And this also uh, shows us how these, this paper was made, that it was actually one sheet and then cut in half and put on either side because it continues there, right? Uh, more lotus leaves, then more leaves, and then irregular pieces of foil balancing what we saw kind of in the upper right. Now, I said a moment ago that the motifs of the poems often have no relationship to the imagery of the under decorations, but this time I think we must suspect that there is. We have the moon and we have the kanji for moon uh, rather visible. Now, in fact, on the right here, uh, this poem uh, by Izumi Shikibu is probably her most famous one, written when she was still in her teens. Kuraki yori. Kuraki michi ni muzo irinubeki harukani terase yama no ha no tsuki. From utter darkness, I must embark upon an even darker road. O distant moon, cast your light from the rim of the mountains. As Chieko Mulhern has written, quote, addressed to a Buddhist cleric known as the Abbot Shoku, the poem alludes to the poet's desire to enter the path of enlightenment represented by the image of the moon. Lotus blossoms also, lotus leaves too, represent enlightenment rising unsullied from the mud of the secular world. On the other hand, it is only the underpainting of the moon that would seem to have anything to do with the left-hand poem by someone named uh, Kunaikyo. Irokainu take no hashiroku tsuki tereite tsumori nu yuki wo harao akikaze. Without turning in color, the bamboo leaves shine white in the moonlight, snow not accumulating but blown by the autumn wind. The next sheet uh, has a largely blue background, and its most conspicuous image is a banana plant. And bush clover, hagi. Um, and again, then some, some foil and diamond shapes and whatnot. Um, however, one poem is from the summer section 
of an imperial anthology. And the other poem is from a spring section. Neither of them speak of banana plants or bush clover, both of which are autumnal topics. So there seems to be no match between the underpaintings and the, po the poems. All right, let's return to the actual writing. As I said, each poem is accompanied by the name or title of the poet, right, as we saw here and here. Um, but these sheets include one more element that is not always present and is very important for our understanding of this work. The Chinese characters left and right appear on, confusingly, the character for left is on the right page and the character for left, anyway, but, but they're there. So one side is the left and one side is the right. And what this tells us is that these poems are being matched in a poetry contest, or uta awase. Now the earliest poetry contest for which we have a complete record of the poems and the procedures is the Teiji'in Uta Awase of 913, sponsored by then retired emperor Uda. Um, early poetry contests were media events with the two sides, the left side and the right side, in matching team costumes and scoreboards made out that look like the Suhama um, with uh, shorelines and birds in gold and silver, and it, it was mostly a social event. Um, for each round, there was a judge, and for each round, there was a winner or a loser, or there was a tie. In the case of this uh, contest, uh, the judge was Emperor Uda, even though he was also a contestant. Um, but he's an emperor, he gets to do what he wants. Um, and the contest had various rounds uh, matching poems with the same topic. Uh, 10 poems on spring, 10 rounds on the third month, five rounds on summer, and five rounds on the topic of love, among others. Poetry contests continued into the Kamakura period and became particularly important in the 13th century when poetry had become a kind of hereditary profession. And the decisions of judges were challenged and long letters would be written back and forth saying, no, he got that wrong and he doesn't know anything. And it was all very heated. Um, under Uda's day, it was just basically an excuse to drink. Um, However, the mid Heian period also saw the development of a new kind of poetry contest, what kind of uh, would later be called a, a desk poetry contest, meaning it wasn't real people, it was some editor just taking poems and matching them. Um, the first example of this was uh, sometime between 1007 and 1009, when the leading poet of the day, Fujiwara no Kinto, had a debate with Prince Tomohira about who was the better poet, the 8th century Hitomaro, whom we've also seen, or the 10th century Kino Tsurayuki, with the, fa with the prince favoring Hitomaro. To decide the matter, Kinto matched 10 poems by each poet, with Hitomaro winning decisively, which was probably a good political move on Kinto's part. Um, Kinto is believed to have then put together the Zen Jugo Ban Utawase, or former poetry contest in 15 rounds, with 30 poets represented. Later still, he changed six of the 30 poets and added 10 po the 10 poems by Hitomaro and Tsurayuki, and creating a text now known as the Sanjunin Sen, or the Selections from 30 Poets. After the death of Prince Tomohira, Kinto made one final revision, creating the Sanju Rokunin Sen with 36 poem, poets, 36 poets and 150 poems. This served as the basis for a visual genre known as the Sanju Rokasen, A, eh, or imaginary, po imaginary portraits of the 36 immortal poets. It's hard to say fast. Um, there are many famous versions of this, uh, one of the best known being the Satake Bon, attributed to the, attributed to the artist Fujiwara no no Buzane with calligraphy uh, attributed to Kujo Yoshitsune, the topic of Mary Beth Graybill's uh, doctoral dissertation, which she may touch on tomorrow perhaps. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, retired emperor Gotoba is also credited with a version of um, the 36 poets portraits. Now, Gotoba was a major poet and sponsored, helped edit, and contributed to what many think of as the finest imperial anthology, anthology of Japanese verse, the Shinko Kinshu, uh, produced in 1205. 
He was also, however, politically ambitious. And in 1221, he led an uprising against the Kamakura shogunate. He failed and spent the remainder of his days in exile on Oki Island. Now, while on Oki, he continued to tinker with the Shin Kokinshu, but in 1234, he also devised an imaginary poetry contest, similar to Kinto's 36, that we call the Jidai Fudo Utawase, or poetry contest between different eras. 100 poets are divided into two teams, with those of the Manyoshu and the first three imperial anthologies on the left, and the poets from the fourth anthology up to Gotoba's own day on the right. Um, three poems from each poet are matched in 150 rounds for a total of 300 poets. He was in exile. He had a lot of time on his hands. So, um, this contest was pictorialized in the 14th century in a, a Hakubyo ink version, uh, one segment of which is in the current show, with Fujiwara no Saneyori on the left team, here identified by his posthumous title, Sei Shinko, or Lord of Clear Truth, and retired Emperor Sutoku on the right. As you can see, we are given all three rounds. Uh, 76, I really can't see. 76, 77, and 78. Okay. Now, the poems in the Go Yose In album are in fact taken from Gotoba's Jidai Fudo Utawase. The first set of poems, with calligraphy attributed to Goyose himself, pits, as we saw, two female poets against each other, Izumi Shikibu, an 11th century contemporary of the tale of Genji author Murasaki Shikibu, and Kunaikyo, who was a lady-in-waiting to Emperor Gotoba. Now, it must be said, however, and I have not studied this, the, the, the Jidai Fudo Uta Wase, uh, but I have now become inspired to, because it's a very unusual uh, contest. Um, three rounds, but you saw, I said, oh, this poem is from the spring section, and this poem is from the summer section. In other words, poems that are not on the same subject are being pitted against each other. How do you do that? Uh, and the other thing to be said is that uh, no indication of winner, loser, or draw is given. Um, so it's an unusual work. Um, and as I said, with this, so in the second, we saw this is a second sheet. Um, and it's very hard to detect what the commonality between the two poems is, uh, Yoshitada's and Masafusa's. So Yoshitada's is from the summer section of the Shinko Kinshu. Once I reproached my love for lack of persistence, now he comes no more, and my regrets grow as great as the heaps of reaped grasses. And Masafusa's is Takasago, is a very famous poem, also in the Hyakuni issue, the 100 poets, one poem each. Consequently, this is my translation. Takasago no oe no no sakura saki ni keri toyama no kasumi tatazumo aran. Above the lower slopes of the high mountains, the cherries have blossomed. O oh, mist of the near mountains, how I wish you would not rise. Um, so, uh, go, the Goyose album includes 12 rounds by 24 poets. We'll look at the rounds more closely in a moment. But first, who was retired emperor Goyose? And uh, why would he have chosen this poetry contest? He was emperor during one of the most momentous periods of Japanese history, the establishment of the Tokugawa shogunate. And I'm quoting now from a catalog of John Carpenter, who was nice enough to come here from New York, and I quote, Goyose remained on the throne for 25 years, from 1586 to 1611, during the crucial transitional period when the warlords Toyotomi Hideyoshi and Tokugawa Ieyasu consolidated their power and made progress towards reuniting a war-torn nation. Goyose's intervention continued the work of his grandfather, Emperor Ogimachi, in redefining the relationship between the court and the newly emerging military government headed by the shogun. As the court struggled to survive, the military leaders lent a helping hand with the court returning the favor 
to mutual advantage. A complex interaction of court and bakfu would come to define the politics of the age, and calligraphy would assume even more importance in the cultural life of the capital. Goyose's role in reasserting the palace as the center of literary production cannot be overestimated." End of quote. Yet, it's a scandal in his final years for which Goyose is best known and which sealed the fate of the court's inferior position vis-a-vis -vis the shogunate. The event is called the Gekirin Jiken, or Dragon Scale Scandal. Gekirin means literally contrary-wise scales, and it comes from a passage from the third century BC Chinese philosophical text, the Han Feizi, and I quote in English translation, now this beast, the dragon, can be tamed, and when trained, can even be mounted. On the underside of its necks, however, it has sharp scales a foot broad that grow contrary-wise to all the others. Anyone who touches them is certain to be killed. The rulers of men, too, have their gekiring, their sharp contrary-wise scales." End of quote. The dragon, of course, is Goyose, and his wrath was aroused by the discovery in 1609 of, oops, that a group of his courtiers and concubines had been meeting clandestinely to indulge in illicit sexual escapades. The emperor demanded that the guilty parties, courtiers and ladies-in-waiting alike, should be, in his own words, executed painfully and before mine own eyes, unquote. This was an unprecedented punishment. They, this did not happen in the imperial court. The shogunate, under the authority of a retired Ieyasu, ultimately refused, executing only two lower-ranking men and exiling five women. But as Lee Butler writes, quote, the scandal fractured the close human ties at the top of court society and caused internal damage personified in the bitter figure of Goyose. In political terms, the scandal provoked conflict between Emperor Goyose and the retired shogun Ieyasu, an outcome neither side had anticipated or desired. Ieyasu had little choice but to refuse Goyose's demand. To defer would have granted the throne authority over a practical matter, which the Bakfu, still in its infancy, could not risk. By any measure, the scandal was a political setback for the emperor and led more or less to his uh, abdication just a couple years later. So happy, happy, joy, joy. Um, let's return to the album and, and the poetry. Um, as you can see, there is no apparent rhyme or reason to the selection of the rounds or their ordering. So um, the first, here we go. So the first round by in Goyose's hand is actually the 148th round of the Jidai Udo, Fudo Uta Wase, as followed by the 124th, and then here's the 75th, the 46th, the 4th, it's hard to see what the rationale of selection was. Um, now, uh, it turns out, however, you'll recall that each poet is matched for three rounds. And except for the third round in red there, every one of the rounds is the first round of the three. Okay? Um, and uh, if you chose just the first round of every pairing of poets, you would have a selection of 100 poets and poems, looking very similar to the much more famous Hyakunin Ishu, or 100 Poets, One Poem Each collection, attributed by Gotoba's fellow poet and co-editor Fujiwara Noteka. There is, in fact, even a reference in government records from around this period of a Hyakuni Ishu Byobu, a hundred poets screen done by Kanotanyu, the kind of folding screens we saw earlier. My guess, it's only a guess, is that the Goyose Shikishi originally came from just that sort of set of screens of 100 poets and poems taken from Emperor Gotoba's Jidai Uda, Fudo Utawase. Now, I am not a calligrapher, so, so, so there's, you saw those three, okay. I'm not a calligraphy expert, 
fortunately have, have people who are. So I cannot, and I'm sorry to say no other scholar has yet, tried to auth authenticate the calligraphy in this work. For my sake, from where I'm standing though, uh, this Edo, and somewhere in here, this Edo look pretty similar. But Goyose was a master calligrapher and uh, competent in many, in many different styles. Anyway, so I cannot speak to the authentication of the calligraphy. Um, the, who the calligraphers were might be recorded on the back of the shikishi uh, if the album was uh, disassembled, which I am not suggesting. Um, we'll just have to go with what they've got. Um, and um, of course, we don't know that the album was put together at the same, that the, 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 the little cartouches identifying the calligraphers were put on at the same time as when the album was made. Um, the technique is, is uh, seen more frequently in um, what are called tegagami, which are fragments of calligraphy with then the, the names of the calligraphers added. Um, so my guess, again, is that the screens were, there, there were screens of these, these shikishi with the 100 poems by 100 poets, uh, and they became damaged, and someone salvaged these shikishi and put them into an album. Again, I'm not a textile expert either. This looks like a good piece of Momoyama period fabric to me, but um, it could be, and that doesn't mean, of course, that it was applied to the album in the Momoyama period. Um, the, uh, so the, the, this work has uh, been displayed in Japan at least twice uh, and appears in Japanese catalogs. And the Sano Museum catalog claims that the album reflects the, my translation, zeitgeist of the Momoyama, meaning presumably sometime before, before 1615. But there's, uh, as I've been saying, there could be considerable time between when the shikishi were calligraphed for the screens and when the fragments were mounted into the album. Uh, and we don't know when the identity, labels identifying the calligraphers were added either. Um, now, the shikishi could of course been produced earlier and identified later uh, after uh, 1929, uh, 1629 rather. Sano Museum catalog also calls these little cartouches uh, kiwame fuda, or authentications, which suggests that there's some distance between when the works were calligraphed and, and when they were identified. Um, still, there are, and, and there are still questions. Um, the biggest one, of course, is that um, not round seven, uh, it, the calligraphy is attributed to, to retired emperor Gomizuno under the name uh, Sento-sama, and that's because um, in 1629, they built the Sento Palace for him. Uh, but by that point, Emperor Goyose would have been dead about 18 years, right? Because he dies in, oops, sorry. He dies in uh, 1611. Is that 11? Yeah. So we know that some of these cartouches identifying the calligraphers had to be done after 1629. Um, but we know uh, that the goyose Shikishi were done before 1611. Um, then there's the question of, um, it makes sense to have Goyose, a retired emperor, be the first set of calligraphers in this album, but then why is Gomizuno number seven with commoner subjects, with subjects above him, right? So the, the calligraphers are not presented in kind of like rank order. So then we would have to try to figure out why that was. Um, then there's a question of why would Goyose have chosen the poem from round 148 to inscribe? As we saw, both poets are women. 
there are emperors in the poetry contest. You would think maybe he would choose one of those. Perhaps, however, though, um, Shiki, uh, Izumi, Shiki Shus, uh, Izumi Shikibu's poem, this Buddhist poem, uh, Wanting Salvation, spoke to Goyo Zain at that particular point in his life. Or another interesting possibility is that I told you about the poetry contest with Emperor Uda, who was judge and participant. When his poems went into the record, they weren't entered as poems by retired Emperor Uda, they were poems by a court lady. So he took a female persona. So maybe this is what Go Yose was doing uh, in this case. Um, now, um, I have not had the time yet, unfortunately, to go through all the poems. There may be a logic of association and progression or some sort of program that explains why these were chosen and why they were ordered the way they are. Um, and that uh, only future research can tell us. And so there are still lots of layers of that onion to keep going at. Thank you. In the poetry contest, what role did the art that the calligraphy was on play? That's a good question. Um, the poems would have been um, presented, written on, on some sort of medium um, and uh, And of course, the person who did that writing would have been very careful about it. Uh, I don't offhand know of whether we have uh, any record of a poetry contest where the actual papers that were used to submit the poems at the contest itself are preserved. Um, it really was in the first, well, and again, it depends on the time period a lot, but uh, as it ultimately developed, it really was about the poetry. Uh, when they were new poetry contests, when you have classic poetry contests, then in a way you might say it's all about the calligraphy, that, you know, uh, let's have something pretty to look at. Um, that, that, The poems are kind of like a, a, a medium here to display the calligraphy, um, so in, which is different from how Gotoba would have been thinking when he put those poems together. Does that help at all? OK. <laughs> the, the notion of a competition seems uh, unusual to, to put on this. Was, was there? Prize was there? It it seems more like a ranking by a reviewer than a competition. Were there any listed criteria for the judging? No. So well, um, so you're talking about this particular work or poetry contests in general? Okay. Well, let's start with poetry contests in general. Japanese poems are supposed to have what's called a hon e, a fundamental meaning. And um, what the poet is trying to do is to get as close to that never reachable essence of whatever the poetic theme or trope is. And that's the basis on which, one of the bases on which the judge decides. You know, as I said, in, in the 13th century, these became very scholarly, and the judge would say, no, I'm sorry, that that line got used in a poem way over there and you're not doing it right, or you know, I've never seen this word in a poem before and I can't allow that, so, so that sort of thing. Um, with the Jidai Fudo poetry contest, um, what is, and the 36 for that matter, what is really of interest is comparing contemporary, contemporary poets with the great poets of the past and seeing if they can hold their own. 
Um, and so, um, yeah, uh, th that's would, that would have been what was interesting to uh, Gotoba when he put it together. And um, here, you know, you have, yeah, like the 100 best poets from the entire history of Japanese neatly divided into the really old and the, you know, not so old, which is, again, a kind of fundamental way of conceptualizing Japanese poetry collections. The first imperial Japanese anthology is called the Kokin Wakashu, which means collections of Japanese poems from the past and present. So there's always that kind of comparative element that, that seems to get in there. So I'm delighted to see Izumi Shikibu at the top of the list, number 148. And as I remember, that was also her death poem. You know, I thought so too, and it's not. In other words, oh. I, when I, I recognized the poem right away, and went, oh, and her death poem, da 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 da. And then when I was looking for a translation, um, I came across Chieko Mulhern's translation, and she wrote it as a teenager. So I was very surprised wow. by that. Wow. Yeah. OK. Um, and I'm also interested, from a cursory look down the list, it seems that most of them are male participants. And as we know, there were many famous waka poets, female waka poets, Ono no Komachi, uh, Izumi Shikibu, Murasaki Shikibu. So I'm wondering what the representation is of why there weren't more women participating in these contests. Yeah. And I, well, I mean, the, the obvious answer is it's patriarchal prejudice. Um, uh, the, this, I, I, I didn't look carefully at the distribution there, uh, but you know, out of the 100 poets of the Hyakuni issue, uh, fewer than 20 are women. Um, so uh, the editor was a male, most of the poets were males that, that were controlling the editing process, so um, yeah, unfortunately. Mind you, there are, uh, you know, there's a famous, uh, famous work uh, of kind of like literary criticism, um, and uh, it's uh, presented as a group of court women talking about their favorite monogatari and their favorite characters and Genji and stuff like that. Um, and at one point, one of them complains and says, you know, it's really unfair that no woman has ever been made the chief editor of an imperial anthology and we should have something like that. And in fact, what that led to was anthologies of poems from monogatari, from romances. Uh, and that was distinctive in two ways, one, um, you know, you mentioned Murasaki Shikibu, who does have poems in imperial anthologies, but none of them are from the tale of Genji, because you cannot put a poem by a fictional character into an imperial anthology. So all those poems in fiction can't get into the most important anthologies of poetry. So that was one reason they then did anthologies of nothing but poems from romance tales. Uh, and. Uh, you know, presumably the majority of those poems as the majority of romance tales were written by women. So they kind of got their separate but unequal uh, chance there. Were the words in the poems chosen for the visual effect and the calligraphy or for the sound of the words? Or were there things like eye rhymes in this yeah. format? Um, yeah, I mentioned that uh, with what is called variant form kana, where you know you have up to 13 cursive Chinese characters you can choose from to represent one sound. Wasn't there some kind of thinking about that? Oh, in this context, I'd like to use this Chinese character because of what it means rather than some other Chinese character. Uh, I am sure I am assured by calligraphy experts, some of whom are in this room, that no, that does that doesn't happen. Um, in terms of um, the poetry contest, especially when it gets serious, um, the poems had to be understandable orally. They couldn't be so complicated that you heard someone recite it out loud and had a clue what it was talking about. 
So in, in the 13th century, um, more important than any, well, the first important thing was that when the poem was recited out loud in the poetry contest, people could understand it. Um, and again, as for records of poetry contests, I have a graduate student here who probably could tell us. Um, um, again, I think things divide into kind of utilitarian, I mean, if you've got a contest in, of 300 poems, you just want to get it bloody copied, right, uh, and, and, and move on. Um, whereas if you're doing, if you're doing some shikishi uh, and they're going to be displayed, then, you know, um, your, your priority is probably on the calligraphy rather than on, well, certainly rather than having the poem be comprehensible when someone tries to read it. I don't know if you've looked at some of these shikishi, but... You know, you go, no, unless you know what that poem is already, I don't see how you're gonna be able to read that. So there, there's a real tension between the artistic flair of the calligraphy and the comprehensibility of the writing. And, and that tension is, is kind of, is often there in, our, in transcriptions of poems that are meant to be primarily visually appealing rather than just conveying the, date, the poetic data. So you said that these, um, these shikishi came um, p potentially from Byobu and were kind of collected together. Were they ever kind of taken out and put back up? Um, were they ever kind of displayed or like what was, like was this a private thing that once the emperor kind of put this all together, he kept it for himself or did he, you know, show it to people? Like how did this kind of continue to interact? Sure, yeah. Well, so, and, and, as, and I need to say, this is just my guess, okay? Uh, I could be completely wrong, and this could have been made to order just this way, and I just haven't been able to figure out why yet. But um, if my guess is right, then um, again, what was being valued was the calligraphy and who the calligraphy was by. Um, all these, most, I think you can say, many, <laughs> many descendants Many branches of the imperial family and many aristocratic families had calligraphic styles for which they were well known. Um, and so um, whoever put this album together recognized, let's say, that he or she had examples by Goyose, who was a famous calligrapher, and by others, and uh, put them together and obviously would have enjoyed them themselves, uh, and presumably would have enjoyed showing them to other people. Ooh, look, I've got some of Goyose's calligraphy. Um, I cannot believe it likely that it would ever go the other way and you would take an album and take out the shikishi and put them back on a screen for someone to kick or get candle wax on, or yeah, you know, I, I just I don't think that's where it's going to go. So once it's preserved in an album, a very nice album, I think that's the way it's going to stay. I, I guess maybe a multi-level question. I'll try to keep it short about English translation. So, one hundred poets, one poem each. There are a lot of translations. There sure are out there. Uh, I'll let you know. You may not be surprised. Mary Beth has directed me to your. Translations. That's what friends are for. Uh, but in <laughs> reading the multiple translations, I wonder what value there is in them in a way in terms of appreciating it. I mean, we appreciate the beauty of the calligraphy. Uh, how important are those translations? Uh, okay, I'm trying to find which level your question is at in that <laughs> multi-level uh, presentation. So uh, are you asking me, when you look at this, do, does it really matter whether you know what the poem says or not? Uh, well, in, in this particular set of sheets, because of the imagery of the moon, A, I think, it, I think Izumi Shikibu's poem is a beautiful, moving poem. Right, she, the the moon is being, the Buddha is being personified as the moon, and she's asking for his grace through the imagery of of moonlight. 
Um, it doesn't get much better. Uh, and I think that kind of evocative sh moon shape uh, on this somewhat abstracted landscape, waterscape, um, I feel like I get a lot more out of that knowing the content of the poem than if I did. But I, you know, that might be a matter of individual taste. So the second part of that is then the issue of the, <laughs> what we're left with in translation, some sound poetic, some don't of the same thing. I mean, there's some bad translations out there. There are. And as... And unfortunately, they're the ones you end on in Amazon first, but we won't go there. <laughs> uh, and I guess the, the question is there, I guess we need to be discerning. Maybe I'm asking, answering my own question. Sure. I mean, um, so if you've looked at my pictures of the heart, you'll know that um, one whole chapter is just taking one poem and looking at the way it's been translated in English from about 1864 to what was then the present. The book is 20 years or more, or oh, 30 years old now? Anyway, 1996. Um, so, um, what, and one of the things I talk about um, is um, Penguin, you know, the Penguin imprint, uh, poetry books uh, that were published, I guess in like, well, the immediate post-war era, when I guess education was somewhat more elevated, not to say elite. And um, Penguin thought they could make money selling collections of German, French, Spanish poetry with the original and the translation side by side. And they, the prefaces actively encouraged the reader to, you know, take your high school Spanish and using the English translation, try to work it out. Um, and we have this convention still uh, with Japanese poetry that we, we give the poem in romanization. So I would like to believe that if someone were interested, they would be able to kind of get some sense of how the original poem is working by taking the English translation and looking at the elements. So a nice presentation, thank you. And uh, my question is this. So I see three different uh, medians here. One is the landscape, two is the calligrapher, and three is the poet. So what I really don't understand, and I haven't researched this, but who was in charge of making everything come together? Would it have been the emperor? Yes. I, I, um, there was always hmm, many large artistic projects um, had multiple participants. Uh, the Tale of Genji, uh, 12th century illustrated scrolls, there were six teams. Um, and each team had a director and then there was presumably someone coordinated all. So what, in this case, what would have happened, I believe, um, is that Goyose would have said, you know, I want to have a Jidai Fudo Uto Wase Byobu. And I'm going to first get the paper made, and then I'm going to send sheets to various people I know, well known calligraphers, and I'm going to ask them, haha, um, to write this particular poem on the paper I have provided. Then they send them all back, and he would have had them mounted. So there's always a director. There's always a guy controlling things um, to the, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure there are cases where that's not true, but normally, you know, it's somebody's project, they're providing the financing, and this would not have been cheap. Um, and they're deciding who's going to calligraph what and get it assembled, and that's true if it's a, illustrated scroll of a court romance or a collection of calligraphy, I would think. Well, thank you. <laughs>